Hi, so uh, my name is Daniel Cohen, and uh, I'll be presenting our work, Learning a Better Negative Sampling Policy with Deep Neural Networks for Search. And this work was done in conjunction with Scott Jordan and Bruce Croft, all at UMass Amherst. So, why do we even care about learning a better negative sampling policy? Uh, well, because neural models work great, right? Uh, you just pass in data and everything works and you get the state-of-the-art retrieval performance and everything's great. Except that this only works in a case where our collection is really well behaved. So let's say this box represents our entire corpus and we want to sample non-relevant documents to train our model so that it can perform well at test time with new queries on potentially anyone on this collection. And so you just sample randomly, you grab some documents, everything's nice, the model learns really well. This is a bit more complicated in the case where our collection is non-uniform. So here we kind of represent uh, partitions of our collection with different colors, and if you just sample without regard to your distribution, well, you could end up with a neural model that is completely saturated with a certain portion. So, you could sample really well, and at the end, you just grab too many documents in one area of your collection, and you've saturated your hidden layers to only perform effective transformations in this area. Or you just don't even uh, select documents well at all. So the idea is, is there a sampling policy that lets us grab doc non-relevant documents from our collection so that in, during the entire training time, it, and once the model converges, it has effective transformations over all partitions of our collection. And so, how do we even do this? And this is generally done by, well, let's grab the top BM25 ranked documents, and then choose a non-relevant document from this portion, and then train our neural model with that for each query. You can do random, which is actually a pretty effective sampling method. Uh, you can use query likelihood as a different method. Uh, you can use handcrafted features such that you want to ad adequately cover your domain. So let's make sure we grab every single possible domain in our collection so that at test time our model knows what our collection looks like. And in the case of click logs, again, you're still grabbing a ranked list from another IR model and hoping that covers the useful documents well. And this kind of boils down to the situation where you have these functions and you're trying to guess what's the most useful function to use for my neural models such that it performs well at test time. And this brings us back to sort of trying to handcraft features, except now we're handcrafting sampling functions. And this is a very common IR comment, but I want to swap it up. And so our user has now become the neural model and she desperately wants to understand the collection well enough to perform retrieval and determine relevance. And our IR problem is now a sampling problem, and our poor little IR model is now a agent trying to find the best documents for our neural model so that she doesn't forget what she's seen, as well as making sure that she knows what's in this giant pile. And for those of you who uh, kind of picked up on that, I said the word agent, so we are, of course, approaching this from a control perspective, which means reinforcement learning. And with the reinforcement learning comes a Markov decision process, or an MVP. And so an MVP is formulated by a tuple of seven elements uh, that describe the, the transition of states and actions and how we structure the problem. And we actually approach this from a model-free perspective, so we don't actually care about the probabilities of one state to another, in the sense that we don't model this explicitly, as well as that reward probability as well. What we do care about is the set of all possible states, as the set of possible actions, a, the bounded set of possible rewards, which is just the reward function, and then the initial state distribution, which is the initial random seed of the neural IR model, and then gamma the reward discount parameter, which I'll explain shortly. So before I go into detail about how we set up our MVP elements, I just want to give a very high level of how we structure this problem. So our agent here, represented by this gray box, as we don't care about details right now, receives a state regarding some information about our neural model and what we've seen during the, uh, what we've seen while training. 
and then this state is passing to the agent, and the agent chooses an action, at which point we sample training data based off of what the agent wants to do. We pass this training data into the IR model, we update the IR model, and then we pass in validation data, which is usually used to check whether models are converged or not, or it's overfit. And this is then passing to a reward for the agent. We grab new state information, the, IR, uh, the agent is updated, and we do this all over again until the IR model finishes, and then we do this whole setup again, each episode, until the agent converges. So this is the paradigm that my work is in. So for how we actually set up the state, it, we represent it in two portions, uh, a state that captures both the IR model information as well as what we've been seeing while training. So IR information and collection information. So the first part is the IR model state, or how can we figure out how well the IR model is learned. And so this consists of four parts. The first is the lost most recent batch. And this is just to let the agent know, how is our training going? Did we just suddenly jump from a nice smooth loss curve to a really high variance? Uh, and are we close to converging? Are we still in this really steep, easy training portion? The next is the L2 normal of the gradient. Again, this just provides some insight for the agent to determine whether our model is in a local minima or has it just made a huge shift in the manifold and needs some type of structure again. And the beta here is just to scale it because we pass in a very large value to a agent, it tends to just collapse the policy to a single value. And then the last two, uh, T over capital T, is just the current state uh, or stage of the epoch we're in, so the current time step. And then E is the current epoch we're in. And so this is just covering how our IR model is doing. The second part is the previous batch information. And this isn't necessary in the sense of controlling an IR model, but IR has tend to be very high variance across queries, so you have some queries that are much easier and other queries that are harder. So we pass in uh, a batch of the previous batch of query and document information to let the agent know how hard the previous batch was. And so in this case, it consists of two functions, phi and psi. Phi is just the average TF IDF embedding of the query and relevant document, and then psi is a function that outputs a set of measures, the cosine similarity between a query and relevant document, the TF-IDF overlap, the length, and the number of unique terms. And so these two portions are combined, and that's what the agent sees at each step to determine how the training is going. The next up is the action space. And we originally wanted to have the agent select individual documents uh, for training. This quickly becomes intractable, just you can't feed in a million documents to a deep neural agent. And the second is that it's very high variance. You can select one document, and the agent only receives information about selecting that single action, and you want neighboring information. And there's some preliminary work in this, but nothing mature enough to really try and get two research areas working at the same time. So what we instead do is we think, well, there's already functions that are effective we're training neural models, so let's have our action be selecting these two functions. So in this case, we have two, BM25 and the random retrieval function, which not necessarily the best, but it still works over a query and collection and outputs a ranked list of uniform value. And then we sample randomly from the top 500 documents retrieved by these two functions. Next up is reward. For those of you not familiar with RL, this is the task of the agent. This is what the policy is trying to maximize. And it's given at each time step, and it's the and it's trying to maximize the cumulative discounted sum. So this is where gamma comes into play. So if we set gamma to zero, well that quickly becomes we only care about this next time step and nothing else after that. So those of you familiar with bandits, this can be viewed as a bandit setup. Uh, if we set gamma to one, this could be, it's like you invest all your money and you take it out when you're 80, so you have this huge amount of money because you care about this very total lifelong return. And in our work, we set gamma to one because we're trying to train a neural model, so it works at the end, so that's what we care about. And in the case of our MVP, 
we set it up as the incremental improvement of map from one time step to another. And so here is just a parameterization of our neural model each time step, and here is the query. And for those of you familiar with TD error, this is, looks like it for a reason. So if we unroll this to two time steps, we see that you can unroll it and then you subtract the identical terms and you end up with a difference from t to t plus two. And we do this for the, all the steps in an episode. You end up with a lot of terms, but you end up with this really nice final value for the reward but that the agent is trying to maximize the performance of the neural model at the end of training minus the random performance of the neural model. So this reward shaping is a relatively hard task in reinforcement learning and this allows the agent to converge to a reasonable policy and it's nice and mirrors TD error. And we use actor critic as our agent here and for those of you not familiar with actor critic it's a derivation of the reinforced method, which is policy gradient, and disregarding math, which we can talk about at the poster. Uh, normal reinforce is uh, not biased, but it's high variance, and it requires you to go through a whole episode before you update your policy, which means that you need to train a neural IR model from scratch to convergence every time you want to update your agent and policy a tiny bit, which is very expensive and takes a very long time and it uses a static baseline. So if a state is really easy, so if a query is very easy and there's a lot of relevant documents and the map is high for this query, well, you don't want a large change in your policy because it was really easy. It's like trying to score a basketball on, uh, in a hoop the size of the whole court. You don't really want to reward your agent for that. And so you weight your updates by this baseline. Reinforce uses a static baseline, which isn't the best. After critic is sort of the opposite. It's biased but lower variance, which is great in RL. Convergence is always easier. And the, uh, it uses online updates. So every time you update your IR model, you get feedback on how well it did, and you can update your policy. Much faster training. And lastly is it also predicts the state baseline. So as you go through your training, the critic learns how the actor should have done on this state and you can say well if this state's really easy the actor nailed this really easy line it doesn't really matter and so these advantages allow it to converge while reinforced we didn't find any stability while training and then just to give a high level understanding of how we represent our state when it passes the agent our agent is a feed forward and cnn model the ir Model information is just a nice vector, so that goes straight into a feed forward. The training data batch information is a matrix, so that goes into a CNN to get local information between the query and relevant document, at which point it goes under some transformations. Max will pass it up to a feed forward, and then we do a sampling of the softmax for the action. And to, again, give a very high level understanding of how we formulate the training. We initialize the neural IR model and get the initial state, the random performance. And then while the stopping condition isn't met, we sample an action. We take that action and generate an aggregate set. We update our IR model. We observe the new state S. We get a reward. We then update our agent, and then we just keep doing this. So in terms of our evaluation, we do this over two IR models to get an understanding of how it impacts. We use this batch pyramid described in the first presentation, which is interaction based, so the query document are combined relatively low. And then the simple feed forward model, which is representation based, and the query document are performed much closer to the final relevant structure. And then in terms of data sets, we use Yahoo WebScope L4 and Robust L4, and these are sort of opposites to each other. Uh, Yahoo is short text CQA, there's a lot of queries, and BM25 is a poor baseline, and then Robust04 is long text newswire, small set of queries, multiple relevant documents, and BM25 has heavily influenced the judgments. And then in terms of baselines, we use uh, expected error reduction, so you just pass the model over, a set of documents, find the documents with the greatest error, and, use, and train on that. Dynamic negative sampling, which we read as a probabilistic approach to expected error reduction. IR again, but only the portion that was trained with 
uh, the reinforced method, and that mirrors the way we're setting up our problem. There's an agent that feeds documents to an IR model, and then a random agent, which actually performs pretty well in most RL settings, and then the base BN25 and random functions. And if we look at our results, in the case of WebScope L4, ACIR, Active Critic or IR, works very well. Uh, what's, even though it didn't get the best performance on the match pyramid, what's really interesting is that it gets close to the BN25 method with the dynamic negative sampling, dynamic lambda, without explicit information to the uncertainty. So this is really interesting. Using the IR model state information and the batch information, it's able to look, infer the uncertainty of the neural model. And in the case of Robust 04, not nearly as nice of an improvement, but still ACIR works well. In the case of the match pyramid, what we see is it's not better than random, but there's been work showing that in the case of curriculum learning, you can come up with these really nice ways to train your model, but random is always a very good baseline. So it's not a bad thing we did we didn't feed a random agent, but it would have been nice to learn a better policy. And then we also experiment with reward shaping, and this is just choosing what the agent should maximize, and it's trying to get the agent to do what we want to do. So in the case of the soccer game, if you tell the agent, I want you to kick the ball as much as possible, it'll just stand in the corner and tap the ball to get as many points as it can. So we, we try out three reward methods, uh, R raw, which is just the pure map score at each time step. The C R ceiling, which is just we find the best map possible of the neural model over a number of trials, and we try and get the agent to close this gap. And then R diff, which is just what we initially showed, the incremental update. And what we see is that R diff performs best, R raw never converges, and this is because the agent essentially learns to gain the neural IR model so that it never actually gets better than slightly random because if you just sum up your rewards forever, if you, the agent can keep the model going without meeting the stopping condition, well, you'll get an infinite return. And then R diff is what we talked about and that works the best. And then R ceiling, it converts sometimes, however, it often it couldn't actually get to that optimal performance, so it would just get the model to convert to a really poor performance and then get the stopping condition met. So it's constantly a negative reward. And then in terms of future work, well, the way we formulate our MDP is really a POM DP, or partially, partially observable. And that's because we're we, the only way to get a full MDP is to pass the few million parameters of the neural IR model into the agent, which isn't feasible. So how do we better portray the state of the neural IR model? And there's been some work on partitioning neural models so you get orthogonal representations. There's a, there's a number of methods that would be interesting to try. And then a universal policy. So right now, each policy is trained on one collection on a single IR model, and they don't transfer well. So it'd be really great to have this universal policy for either a single IR model or a single collection and then can fit any type of switch between them. And so in conclusion, sampling is critical. Even if you don't use RL, you really should look into BER, expected error reduction, BM25, random, how you're choosing your negative documents. If you do choose RL, it achieves comparable performance to explicit entropy-based methods. It's robust to model collection, so even if you switch your collection, it'll eventually learn how to fit that collection while sampling. And then, yes, it will uh, able to approximate uh, explicit uncertainty information. And that concludes my talk. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the generous ACM student travel grants.